So welcome to this evening's lockdown webinar brought to you in association with British Rowing's official analytics partner SAS, working to help give you the power to row. Tonight's topic is about returning to coaching. So I would very much like to introduce tonight's coaching panel. We've got Kate O'Sullivan, Deputy Chair of British Rowing. Kate is also the lead coach of Tees Rowing Club Juniors and Teesside University programmes. Also joining us tonight, Pete Shepherd, Chief Coach for the GB Under 23 and Junior programme. Then we're also joined by Rachel Hooper, who's Head of Rowing at the Grange School, Coaching Representative for the North West, and whose expertise lie in the use of technology and online learning to support the development of coaches. And last but very much not least, Vicky Parry, founder member of the Isle of Ely Rowing Club. She chairs the National Coaching Committee and is the representative for coaches on the British Rowing Sport Committee. So before we kick off, just a little bit of housekeeping. The webinar is recorded and will be available shortly after tonight's live session. We encourage you to ask questions using the question tab on the side of your screen. And due to the large audience, we do have everybody on mute. But any questions that don't get answered this evening will be posted on the website in the next few days. And there's also some handouts for you that we hope we find uh, that we hope that you find useful. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Kate O'Sullivan. Kate. Thanks very much for that, Sarah. And good evening to you. I was just saying it feels a bit odd really not to be at Henley. Normally I'm packing up a picnic or pulling a crew in at this point. So, you know, really just welcome to you all. Tonight's webinar is very much focused on our coaching community um, and how we can collectively work together to enable our sport to get back out on the water within the bounds obviously of the restrictions that we're working on at the moment. Um, in line with the government approach, um, you may have picked up by now that we have started to move our position from British Rowing from regulations to providing advice. And that's to enable now all of you, um, all of our members, all of our clubs, to make decisions um, that are really in line with their situation. So it's about informed decision making now as we move forward. The update, you know, um, hopefully you've all read that came out on Monday morning. Um, if you haven't had a chance to look at it yet, um, it is up on the British Rowing website. Ideally, we, we would have moved everything through until phase C by now, which would have meant all the bars, opening, changing rooms, gyms. But as we know, in the government guidance that came out, that wasn't um, quite the case. So we have moved to phase C, but it does mean that um, we're not in a position yet to be saying gyms and changing rooms um, are open. There are There is quite a bit of lobbying going on still between Sport England and Sports and Recreational Alliance to, to move on from that. Um, as we all know, very sadly for Leicester, I'm thinking of our colleagues in Leicester tonight, um, they're not coming out of the, the lockdown phase just now. So it's been really interesting exercise. Their committee's been having to think about how they reverse some of what they're, they're doing at the moment. And it's really important for all of us to think about whatever we're putting in place is that we are in a position that we can um, easily reverse it if sadly we, we have to do that. Our coaches absolutely sit at the heart of our sport and, and without them, we, we can't continue to push the boundaries out in our sport, um, whether it's getting you know beginners out or our juniors out or our vulnerable adults. Um, we really need to find a way to help the coaching community come back together, which is why we wanted to focus this session, particularly on returning to coaching. We wish, I wish we had a perfect set of information, but inevitably things are changing all the time. Advice is changing all the time. and the COVID group is trying to keep up with that. In making the decisions though, um, it's really also for us to be aware that different clubs have different situations. We don't know the coaches, may what, what the coaches have been through and you can't make assumptions about whether all the coaches are gonna come back. And I know that Pete, um, Vicky and uh, Rachel will start to unpack that as we go on today. Just a few um, messages when I asked the COVID situational re review group anything that they particularly wanted to highlight tonight. They really wanted to highlight the importance of taking a cautious approach. Um, the risk assessments are absolutely uh, critical in this and also taking in the safeguarding responsibilities. Don't push yourselves too hard. Don't push um, others too hard, whether that's the coaches, the athletes or the volunteers into doing things that they don't feel comfortable about at the moment. Um, and then if an activity 
a real principle is if an activity could be done pre-COVID-19 um, and it passes all the relevant um, risk assessments and COVID protocols, then there's no reason why it can't be done now. So to no further ado, as, as we go on through tonight, I'd really like just to bear in mind some of that. You'll all have your different reasons for being here. And I hope we can, between the three presenters we've got, we'll capture the different angles. If you've got questions that are coming to mind, then I'd really encourage you to pop them in as we go through. It's just much easier to pick them up than just literally them all coming at the last moment. And we, as Sarah has said, we will be looking at those. And where we can't get to them all tonight, we will make sure that they go in to inform um, our thinking. So really just remain, remains for me to say, you know, a massive thank you for all the efforts that you continue to put in. And then to pass over to Pete, who we all know very well, um, who will pick up on the view from Caversham. Kate, Kate, thank you very much. And good, good evening to everybody. And thank you for the opportunity to join you all tonight to be part of a discussion, <coughs> excuse me, on coaches and coaching particularly in this new world we, we are now working in. Um, as Kate mentioned, hopefully uh, you've had a chance to catch up with the advice on the British Rowing website that we have provided so far to support coaches and coaching. Um, I, I think probably my bit here is that coaches are a critical interface uh, between your club committees and your rowers. Uh, and that's why I think it's important that we have this webinar on tonight to, to, to really sort of reinforce that the role that coaches play in your clubs, schools, universities, uh, in, in, our, in, in what is a fantastic sport. Uh, I only have a, a small section tonight, really, but I'm available for, to be part of the, the panel at the end for questions. Uh, and my uh, small section is to share some insights into some of what we've what we are having to put in place for our British rowing employed coaches, whether they're Caversham based or remote based in one of our clubs around the country. Um, and uh, you know, it's a pleasure to have two experienced volunteers who are on the ground in our sport uh, uh, to follow me, sharing their thoughts about supporting our coaches in in all our clubs. So so to, so to Caversham. And uh, you'll you'll probably be aware that uh, at the moment we haven't we haven't returned to rowing uh, at, at our Nat elite training centre at Caversham near Reading, uh, whereas many clubs are already got people active uh, in single skulls on on the water. Um, as an elite training centre, the, gov the government has has insisted that we have to operate to a very high spec uh, to. Um, and that was sort of set out quite early on for uh, elite training centres and professional sport. Uh, so for, for our coaches uh, and rowers in, in as well, really, um, for the, the, return to, the return to Caversham uh, starts by all coaches and athletes going through a, a thorough opt-in process to check they are comfortable to come back. Uh, th this includes uh, a checklist around physical and mental health before they sign up to say they are happy to opt in, uh, and that that is that that is done through uh, their through people's line managers uh, and the medical team at Caversham. Uh, on on a right, and uh, we we are we are going to test Caversham out next next week actually for ten days with a small group, and we've created. Uh, one-way routes through Caversham and those that have had the have had the opportunity to go to Caversham will appreciate that uh, that it's a, a, a largest building but uh, and normally would accommodate you know 80 90 100 people on a daily basis and we're having to really rethink how, how we operate in that in that venue going forward but we are we are going to have a, a small group come in next week uh, of athletes and coaches and uh, on arrival at Caversham each day, each person, athlete and coach, will be asked a series of, of questions around um, whether they have shown any of the signs related to COVID-19 uh, in, in, the, in the preceding 24 hours. They will also have their temperature checked uh, on arrival. Uh, and then, so just to make sure that uh, everybody is, has, first of all, signed up um, 
in the week preceding to say they're happy to opt in but then on a daily basis we will we will be checking uh that people are 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 still healthy and are are following the, the appropriate guidelines but uh, all our all our coaches at Caversham uh will be required to carry level one ppe on their person or if in a launch in their safety bag to facil facilitate a rescue if required and that and that's the responsibility of of people of coaches really is that you know you have to support people uh, and rescue people if there if there is an issue um so so that's an example of what we're having to do at Caversham and why it's taken a, a bit of time to, to 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 get to that position for those employed coaches uh, based remotely whether in a world-class start program or a Henley stewards coach or like myself and the the under 23 and junior coaching development team um, we will re we'll be required to go through a, a similar opt-in process with with our line managers before returning to work this this will it, this will make sure the coach has a full understanding uh, so for the, those based in clubs this will make sure the coach has a full understanding of the club risk assessment and processes for risk mit mitigation in that club as well as completing a, a health checklist on a daily basis so uh, a world-class start coach will will have to uh, check in with steve gunn to opt in first as the uh, world-class start manager uh, but they will also have to be a conversation between the host club to ensure that uh, everybody's happy uh, with with what what the next step would be um, also if a, if a club has has any particular training or education requirements for before it allows anybody back in into their club um, the 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 employed coach of british rowing will will have to make sure they follow that as well uh, my message, my basic message is that every coach should not be working on their own in this returning to coaching uh, and that a line manager, uh, a, a, a club employment management group for professional coaches or a member of the club committee should be part of that process as it should be a shared responsibility. Um, please ensure this this support is available for, for, for your coaches. Um, the final bit for, for our coaches and and i think we can sometimes think that once we get going everything's everything's is, is up and running again um after two weeks or an agreed period of time between the coach and the line manager or club support network there, there should be a follow-up conversation to confirm the opt-in decision is still appropriate following a, a bedding in period of, of that coach and and the club that they're working in um, I think to to clubs, and this will be picked up by uh, the, the next two speakers. You know, the professional coaches, of whom there are now many in our sport, the, em the employer has a responsibility to its employees. The volunteer coaches, are, who for again, there's many uh, clubs, need to value these people. As I said earlier, the the link they provide to the rowing members, uh, they need to ensure that the coach doesn't feel isolated. Um, making sure it's enjoyable and safe first for your coaches will will be a priority for the coaches um, take one step at a time in this new world don't be afraid to share or voice your ideas there is support there and that sort of collaboration together um, is really important everyone everyone's environment is unique uh, so one model doesn't fit all but but let's share the load together um, so for, for me, that's uh, I'm happy to take questions as we go or uh, or at the end, which I think probably is Sarah's preferred choice. I'm now going to hand you over to Rachel Hooper, as introduced earlier, the regional coaching rep for the Northwest region and head of head of rowing at the Grange School. Over to you, Rachel. Thanks very much, Pete. Um, so just before um, starting to, to chat to you, I'm going to um, ask Sarah to put up a couple of poll questions. So one is related to people who are um, coaching or returning to coaching, and one is in, in relation to um, those of you who are involved in supporting coaches to return to coaching. So Sarah, can I ask you to pop the poll questions up? Hopefully the technology will work. Here we go. So. If you're a coach, how confident are you about returning to coaching? Um, so if you can um, click your answer. So 
So Sarah, if you can pull that back down when, when you've got plenty of answers. I'm not able to see how many uh, people are coming through on it, so. So just a couple more seconds on that one. And then Sarah, can we flick on to the next one, please? just waiting for the technology to work at the other end. Okay, so in terms of results there, we've got 4% not feeling confident, 31% uh, unsure, uh, which is probably uh, where quite a few of us are. Um, I'm very mixed, very confident, very confident, which is fantastic. Obviously, everybody will have interpreted that question in their own way and in relation to their own environment as well. So just flicking on to the next question then. So if you're part of the return to rowing at your club, how confident are you that your coaches will return? So this is for anybody else that's not a coach who's, who's on today, basically. Um, and I think we've got quite a few of those as well. Okay, so five more seconds on that one. And then we'll bring up the results. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, so we're again quite confident about people returning, which is um, useful to know. Okay, so if I move on to, uh, we bring that down then, Sarah, um, the next part of my presentation. So um, just in terms of the feedback from that from that poll then, obviously by the very nature, the fact that you're on a webinar on a, I think it's Wednesday, Wednesday evening, um, on what is the first day of Henley, or what should have been the first day of Henley, suggests that you are people that have stayed engaged with, with the sport and have stayed engaged with, CPD and the online and these lockdown webinars as well, which have been fantastic. Um, however, there will be a huge number of people who are either disengaged or feeling quite anxious about the situation at the moment. Um, so potentially you might be in a lead coach role, potentially you might be in a, in a voluntary role. Um, there'll be an awful lot of, of mix of people. So really the question that I was going to start with is, are you ready? And, and by the, the nature of that, that poll, first poll question was that the confidence levels of the people on the, 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 um, the webinar this evening are quite high. But life has been very different. Um, what have we missed as, as coaches? And um, if I share some of my sort of personal thoughts, I think for me, it's been a routine. Um, it's people. I've really missed working with, with athletes. Um, it's I've missed their energy. I've missed the a focus of, of the season. Um, you know, we are at the peak focus of the season at the moment. And also potentially priorities have changed a little bit as well. So those are all things to consider, particularly if you're managing coaches um, or, or and committees who are working with coaches that coaches are having been impacted by this significantly. Um, and it's not just the athletes who've missed time on the water. There are an awful lot of coaches who have really, really missed time on the water. They haven't had the training focus. Yes, they've been potentially running Zoom sessions and things, but they've, they've missed that engagement. So I have spent my time as a coach um, and as a coach developer in the region, just engaging with my coaching network and just wanted to bring out some of the, the words that are coming out um, from coaches. And there's some positives and there's some negatives. So the blue ones on the outside are, are the things that have really impacted potentially coaches in quite a negative way. Um, that they're feeling frustrated, anxious, vulnerable, depressed, confused. Um, and equally on the inside, we've got people who are feeling quite relaxed. Um, you know, they're, they're not having quite as much of a fraught time as usual at this time of year. Um, got relaxed twice, so <laughs> very relaxed. Optimistic, they're feeling quite safe. 
um, particularly at the start of lockdown, they were starting to feel a bit relieved um, that, that things had been taken out of their hands and, and they, you know, decisions were being made for them. Um, and equally, they're feeling energised. Um, we've had some downtime. That's been fantastic. Um, and, and potentially athletes are feeling the same way. But for coaches, there, there's all that mix of emotion. Um, and it has been really up and down. Um, certainly um, losing that sense of purpose has been quite challenging. Um, I fit into the, the furloughed and frustrated box and I've been speaking to a number of the, uh, of the furloughed coaches um, and they've felt the same. Um, by our very nature, coaches want to be busy and we want to be doing the best by our athletes and it's been really frustrating. Um, so those who've been furloughed, they found that quite challenging as well for volunteers. You know, restrictions are restrictions and, and, and it is really frustrating. So um, we're all in this together on that. But have a think about what your mental and your physical well-being has, has been like and how it may have changed pre-lockdown and, and compared to now. Um, certainly with those coaches who might be quite isolated, um, who haven't got somebody that's managing them and who aren't necessarily part of a big team, um, that might have been quite significant. And equally for those who are, who are working with coaches and, and expecting them to come back, actually really think about the circumstances of what your coaches have been going through. Um, so this is something that, that came up um, on a different webinar that I was on, actually, and it is similar to a grieving process in some ways, what we've been through um, as coaches and as a sport and as a nation. Um, uh, it, there's certainly I've had similar feelings as a coach to when I was forced to retire because of injury, that we've had things taken away that that we don't want to have had taken away. We've had no choice about it. Equally, the DICE athletes that I work with, as an example, you know, some of them have had an opportunity to race in the GB team taken away from them and for those age restricted athletes in particular that's been really really difficult and we need to support them to come back and equally for those coaches who were on a really you know big trajectory to maybe their first time supporting a GB athlete um, it's been really really difficult so let's not avoid the fact that all these feelings have been happening it's really important to to really acknowledge them and not just go oh, okay we didn't row for a bit and now we're going to get back to rowing having gone through a big grieving process myself um not rowing wise but personally after a big loss life is not the same life is different and allow it to be different but in a positive way so it may be that you just slow down on things a little bit that maybe you were working too hard as a coach maybe you were giving up too much of your time as a volunteer maybe you've now enjoyed more time with your family and don't feel bad about going actually and I don't want to coach both days at the weekend. I only want to coach one day or I don't, I don't want to coach a full day. Um, so think about the things that how we can get through this process and use it in a positive way and use it to look after yourself as well. So um, really, the, the most important thing is that you need to put yourself first as a coach. And people who are looking after coaches need to allow them to put themselves first, because if we don't look after ourselves as coaches, and we don't look after the people who are, who are at, at the heart of, of making the sport work then we're not gonna be able to, to get out of this really. And we're not going to be able to support our rowers to get out of this. So please don't assume that coaches are going to come back. Please don't assume that they are going to come back and do things the way that they used to do them and commit to things in the same level, at the same level that they used to as well. Um, so have those discussions and it's really important to to, to have those open discussions and not just assume that, OK, right, you're looking after the J17, 18, 18 boys this season, off you go. It's actually, OK, how are you feeling about this? And, and how and you need to be able to feel confident and comfortable having that conversation with your coordinators and with the people who are supporting you. So you, your coaching life, your work life balance um, may change. Your priorities may change. Some of you may just want. I mean, I know that a lot of people are just ready and chomping at the bit and just want to get back going. Uh, but we do need to be careful. We been through trauma um, and we need to acknowledge that and, and we really need to support each other as well. So how are you preparing mentally for returning to coaches? So some questions um, to ask yourself would be what are you going to face when you return? Um, what what state um, are your athletes going to be in when they when they return um, or when you some of you will have had lots of lots of engagement with them online uh, while you've been apart physically um, and some of you won't have had any at all if you've not been working um, or you've been furloughed for as an example so um, what what are your anxieties about their anxieties um, and what are you going to face in terms of 
not just the practicalities, but what your athletes are like as well. Um, what new challenges are you, are you going to have and how prepared are you to take on those new challenges? Um, your sense of perspective may have changed in the past. I know that when I was volunteering as a coach, I, I put heart and soul into it and I still do as an employed coach. Um, but you do, you do put your heart and soul into it and it becomes your life. Um, however, priorities may have changed now um, and, and as a result of this because circumstances may have changed uh, and we need to understand from a coach's perspective what position they're now in. Um, so how can you prepare your athletes and your committee and parents that you potentially work with for your new vulnerabilities as a coach? Um, this is an opportunity to show that you are human, you're not a robot that is uh, everybody's back and call 24 7 you are a human being you're a coach um and yes you want to do do the best by your athletes but actually you need to look after yourself so go back to that um ideal that we really need to be looking after ourselves first um the planning side of it there is some fantastic um guidance in the return to rowing um document the most up-to-date one in terms of how we can start to plan to support athletes to get back onto under the water um we have got out of the habit of planning a little bit because we've not had anything to really focus on. Um, it's not something we've really had to plan for because everything's been out of control. We don't know when the next competition is going to be. However, we're, we're obviously putting things in place in the hope that those, those things are going to happen. So really ask the question, what are your first few sessions going to be like? What's the focus going to be? And the UK Coaching Return to Coaching webinar asked the question, do your first few sessions actually need to have a performance focus? What is what are the benefits of, the, of having a performance focus? And actually, should it not just be about reconnecting with your athletes, having that time together, reconnecting, understanding the journey that they've been through, them understanding the, the journey that you've been through um, over the last few months as well? Um, so you can keep it really simple. Just plan to have safe and enjoyable sessions. We're at the end of the season, uh, whilst it hasn't been much of a season because of flooding and, and then coronavirus, um, it is still the season and we need to be wary of not bringing winter training in too soon. Um, so refer to the Return to Rowing document, engage with the right people before your first session and it may be that you want to just really manage some expectations in terms of saying, right, I'm gonna try and make this work in, in the way that we planned it for the next two weeks and then we'll review it, like Pete said, um, so be wary that we need to, to manage those expectations with, with the people that you're working with. The mistakes will happen um, and you want to make sure that those, that those are managed as well and we can review them on an ongoing basis. Um, a really key message, um, if you're wanting to, some athletes will want to come back and show you how fit they've got while they've been, to, while they've been off the water, um, some might not. Um, however, it's potentially a time for thinking about self-assessment rather than coach assessment. So if you're putting a 2K test in for early doors, actually, what's the purpose of that um, other than breaking people? Um, getting athletes to measure, OK, scale of one to 10, what was your fitness level pre-lockdown? What was your fitness level now? Really simple things. So keeping it really nice and straightforward. But let's save the falling off ergos until later on and, and once we've engaged in and got back into the real swing of training. Um, winter training is coming. Let's not start it in June. Um, the temptation is really going to be, right, we're allowed back on the water, we're allowed to coach again, let's just get going for 2021 season. Think about it. Think about the break that you normally have in August. Think about the, the wave of the, and the, the periodization of a training programme. And, and really, we want to have strong, robust athletes, mentally strong athletes as well, um, in the summer of 2021 not peaking in December. Um, so let's make sure that we really take that on board. Um, and it will be really challenging because athletes will be, and as coaches, will want to be out on the water and take the opportunity to, to really get catch up, get ahead of the game, whatever you want to call it. But we know that fatigue will come in and let's not forget that. Um, so don't start your winter training in, in June and, and really have a proper break. So um, just my final few messages there, really, um, particularly on the um, managing expectations, be cautious of spreading yourself too thinly. So as an example, if you're um, if we're in small boats for, for a, a significant amount of time, that might mean more sessions for you to be able to get people on the water. However, don't underestimate it and how much extra time that's potentially going to take if we're only allowed to have groups of six together. 
Um, so don't spread yourself too thinly. That might mean less water time for your athletes, and that's absolutely fine. They've managed up till now. It's still only June. We don't know what position we're going to be in September. So take it steady. Allow yourself to be vulnerable, I think, is a key message as well. Um, it's a chance to potentially develop op uh, relationships with um, parents a little bit more and get them to understand you know, your commitments outside rowing, you are not just a rowing coach, you have a life as well. And that is important with your well-being to, to maintain that balance um, and allow them to look after you a little bit as well um, and open up those conversations as to how you're feeling. It's very much often a one way conversation in coaching. So this is an opportunity to change some of that um, and allow yourself that opportunity to really um, build that relationship a little bit with your athletes as well. So that's just some of my thoughts off coming off the back of, of getting, you know, 100 days, I think it is today and, and getting back into things. So um, I'm really pleased to pass over to Vicky, who is the chair of the National Coaching Committee. Um, and Vicky's going to um, run through some slides um, as well. Um, and I'm going to come off the audio now and come off the video. So, Vicky, I will pass over to you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, before I start, I think Sarah's got another poll for us. So has your club spoken to you about returning to coaching? I'll give you a few seconds to answer that one. Okay, Sarah, have we got an answer there? Just give it one more minute, just while everybody just quickly votes. Thank you, Sarah. 10 more seconds. Okay, so 56% yes, but 44% 40 no. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Okay, so we've heard from our speakers that things have changed. And from our poll, about a third of coaches are now feeling less confident and more vulnerable than they were. So I'm going to look at how clubs and coaches can support each other. Our coaches will have had time, as you've heard, to reflect on their role and their commitment. Priorities may have changed. But what does a coach normally do? Next slide, please. This is probably what many rowers think of as coaching. The coach turns up having planned a practical session within a programme, briefs the athletes, has either a water work or an S&C session, debriefs with the athletes and then reflects and reviews before planning the next session. They often work in isolation and some would say they're alone to themselves. But what about all the other time consuming activities that they do, that the rowers don't always see? Here are just a few. I'm sure you can think of some more. All of these activities take effort and time. If you're a coach, you're probably, there are probably areas you'd rather not think about. You just want to get on with the practical coaching. Have you ever tried putting these in an order of priority? Which ones don't get the priority they deserve? We're all human after all. And now with the COVID-19, there are additional responsibilities. Next slide, please. These additional activities, which have become essential, are taking even more time. Some like managing social distance or hygiene will be familiar, but others such as managing different expectations, the athlete who can't wait to get back and overdoes it, 
or the reluctant junior who's been one of the 25% of children nationally who've done no exercise at all during lockdown. We'll need different approaches. Have you thought of the pressure of a coach may be under, being under the watchful and sometimes critical eye of other members or parents? With smaller groups and more sessions, there'll be more demands on coaches, which they may be less able to manage well. So what can be done? Next slide, please. If you're a coach, can you just put in the chat box, what's the one thing you feel you need that will make you feel supported in your role? Next slide, please. And if you're one of the club members or officials out there, what one thing could you do personally or as a club to support your coaches? Again, please write your answers in the chat box and we'll collate them later. I'll give you a little time to do that. Let's now have a look at some of the ideas that have been happening. Next slide, please. I think the most important message that's coming through, and both Pete and Rachel have mentioned this, and, and Kate too, is communication. The coach, Pete said, was the interface between the club and the athletes. And we've all no doubt that successful coaches, good coaches, build sex successful clubs. So how can clubs work with coaches to relieve some of the concerns and make coaches feel more comfortable about their return to coaching? Next slide, please. I think it will be helpful to start asking some questions. And there are, some, there are several on this slide. Whilst not all clubs have had athletes banging on their doors to get back, some individuals have been ignoring club and British rowing advice and going out as they please. Discussions we've heard around this topic have highlighted the need for up-to-date codes of conduct and disciplinary and grievance procedures to resolve problems within the club. Are your clubs up to date? Some of the questions may lead to conversations which are not easy for instance, financial issues will not be an obvious one, but if a coach's work situation has changed or family circumstances, they may need to pay their subs or pay for some CPD, such as first aid, but can they afford to do that now? Who would they go to? How comfortable would they feel asking for help? Some of these areas lend themselves to help from members other than the coaches. Who else could help? I suppose in line with what Pete mentioned earlier, the first question is, do you have a clear coaching structure with a line of communication for your coach? In business, this would be a line manager and professional coaches probably have a line manager. But in a club, it may well be a more informal structure. Who would the coach go to? Who is there to make sure that the coach is OK? And then for specific areas that the coach has to deal with, in addition to the practical coaching responsibilities, could the CWO, the club welfare officer, take a more active role around athlete welfare? IT, technical problems, can be a real headache for coaches. But is there someone in the club who's tech savvy who could help with the new booking system or recording athletes' um, feelings and their, their physical welfare? Do you have a nutritionist, a doctor or a physio or an SNC coach amongst your members? You might not have a, an Anne Redgrave, but there may well be doctors who can help at the current time. If you don't ask, you won't know. And a forgotten group. What about your coxes? They are so often overlooked in clubs 
but and they're without a role at the moment they can't be out there coxing but they may know the crew they may know the athletes better than you do there could be tasks that they could help with such as assessing the athletes or recording information so do think about asking for help and as a club supporting coaches with some of these other activities there have been there's been quite a lot of creative work going on um, and it's been interesting to listen to people around the regions around the country to see what's been happening next slide please the british webinars this one um, and some of the others have certainly been a great initiative from British Rowing and I'm sure we're all grateful for those. For those of you who watched the volunteer webinar last night, there was some great work going on at Maidenhead Rowing Club and if you haven't seen that, I suggest you have a look at it um, when it becomes available later. Technology's improved. Many clubs now have regular Zoom meetings on, or new booking systems many regional meetings or national meetings have been happening very effectively remotely some coaches have been offering virtual coaching sessions to both individuals or groups some clubs have asked an expert in a field such as robin williams or a nutritionist to run a zoom event for their members small groups of coaches have been getting together either inter or intra club and meeting virtually to discuss coaching issues and, and share ideas. Those clubs hub, coaching hubs have been, become very effective. The WAGS region coaches have taken it a step further. They've been watching some of the BR webinars and following up with a virtual get together to discuss the content, rather like a region group or book club. The Eastern region has had guided Zoom meetings, <coughs> excuse me, followed by clubs sharing resources, such as procedures, competency assessments, and risk assessments. And those are available online, and a link to that will be in the handout um, after the webinar. The Northwest region has been looking at the future of competitions with their new website, Team 21 Northwest. And the Thames website too has got some information of dealing with some of the COVID issues. And these regional links, as I say, will be added to the handout. All of these ideas have benefits which will almost certainly be carried forward and inform future coaching. But I'm sure there are more ideas out there. What have you been doing? What can you share with others? Again, please put any ideas um, in the chat box as we go along. Next slide, please. So, taking a step back, this coaching pattern works for coaching, but it works in the new situation as well, as guidance and circumstances keep evolving. Plan, plan together. Keep the conversations flowing. Let everybody know what is happening and why you've made the decisions that you have. Make small changes. Try a new way of working. Then take feedback and review. What actually happened? what felt right, and then amend your plan if necessary. British Rowing's guidance is a step-by-step -step guide. Clubs have reported that it's easier to take those small steps to see how things are going, rather than make sweeping changes. Don't be afraid to say, no, this isn't working. We need to go back and try something new. And above all, keep those conversations going support each other, look after your coaches. Thank you for listening and for your input, and please keep sending your ideas and questions through um, as we move now to looking at some of the questions that have been sent in. Thank you. That's great, thanks Vicky. Um, so I'm going to just um, give you a little bit of feedback on some of the things that have, that have come up. Um, definitely around the what one thing can you do either as a coach or as a club to support your coaches. Uh, lots of um, feedback about asking volunteers for help, um, training your coaches, so giving them some training, um, some, some um, 
feedback around one-to-one -one discussions with your coaches to understand their personal needs and how to incorporate these into the club response. Um, there's also some um, requests from coaches to be consulted about future plans rather than having things imposed on them without thinking them through. Um, more discussions with club chairs and captains. Um, there's also a request for clubs to communicate guidance clearly and update it regularly and involve coaches in those discussions. Um, being asked how you actually feel about coming back to coaching. So all very similar, keeping those lines of communications open. And then we have a few questions. So I'd like to come out to the panel. So first of all, Pete, if I could start with you, if you're there. Yeah, coming back. Are you able to explain what level one PPE is? Yeah, so um, when, we, when we were first uh, advised about PPE for Caversham, we were told that we were going to probably have to operate at level three, which is which is virtually like they have in a hospital, basically. Um, but that that got downgraded uh, to so so level one PPE is a uh, a, mar a face mask, uh, uh, gloves, and uh, an apron, uh, a plastic uh, a, you know a, a, a plastic apron. Um, the the apron is there basically for, in case there is a, an issue where bodily fluids are, are are present if you're in a rescue situation if so, somebody cuts themselves or something uh, and so the aprons there is that and and the, and the gloves and the gloves likewise and obviously the face mask is is a uh, something that's uh, that's continually being discussed at, at government level anyhow about when people are in public transport or should we be wearing them when we're in houses or in, in sorry in shops in things like that but but for now, that, that's what we're operating with, uh, a face mask, uh, rubber gloves, and uh, a plastic apron, basically. That's great, thank you, Pete. Um, sticking with the um, subject of safety, um, Kate, I wonder if you can, I can come to you around this, because we've, we've had a few questions over the last couple of weeks about safety launches. So the question is, can we launch a safety boat with five people from different households, including juniors, while, while maintaining one metre social distancing and wearing face masks? Okay. Every launch is, dif is different. And uh, I, I would urge clubs to, to look at what, what is required when Putting a launch on the water and then bringing it off the water again, uh, and and go through the, the the risk assessment process of you know how you would clean down a launch if people a number of people have touched it. Um, you know what what is the what do you require to put a launch in and off in, in on the water and off the water again at the end of the session? Uh, and I, I think. Yes, yes, I think it can be done, and I think launches are people are starting to use launches. But but every club has to look at their own circumstances and make and make a judgment based on uh, the risk and the, the mitigation uh, processes and protocols they need to put in place. That's absolutely right, Pete. To move back to the risk assessment, but I'll also add to that as well. Um, you can look at who you've got in your groups as well so i know one of the things that i'm looking at is i've got juniors and parents some of those parents have become launch drivers themselves they're in effect in the same household so can they be there putting the launch out together and they can be a bit closer together but also um getting into that i think we've all got into that habit of standing where there is a bit of tape or a, a cross or something like that you know you can also look at at your launches and if necessary literally mark out you know, these are the places where you can hold on to. Um, and then, yes, obviously wear a face mask. But I think it, it's just about working it through. You know, if, if, it, if, it's, if it's possible, then you can do it. But you need to use your common sense that if it's just not possible because of the nature of the steps you've got to climb or something like that, and you can't find another in a, innovative way, well, then you need to make your own decision. Great, thank you both. That's really helpful. Um, I have a question for for Rachel. 
Um, Rachel, how do we as coaches engage athletes that may not want to return to rowing because they want to try another sport now? Um, yeah, really interesting question. I think all sports are potentially going to have similar challenges. Um, thinking about this, if I had started rowing in September, given the season that we have had, <laughs> um, potentially I would never have raced. Um, I'd have had a lot of time in the gym um, and doing land-based work because of flooding, and I'd never have rowed in the sunshine and the warm. <laughs> um, so a lot of those particularly people who are new to the sport have not seen the not that winter training is not enjoyable they've not seen the fun part of the sport they've not done side by side racing particularly those who are as example year nines or j14s and those first year university students as well that's it's a big commitment to say yeah i'm i'm happy to go back into winter training with potentially more flooding and more time off the water again and i think that it's just starting to establish why somebody's not wanting to return to a sport is the important part. Um, really having that co conversation. Um, it could be that they just aren't interested anymore and or they um, they don't want to put themselves through that they didn't enjoy it first time round. Um, if it is somebody that's been very well established in the sport, is it somebody that doesn't like single sculling? Um, and the prospect of doing that is, is not much fun for them. So um, have that discussion as well. Is it the prospect of not having any um, potentially not any big competitive opportunities in coming months? However, I do think that we're in quite a strong position as a sport, certainly coming from a school. Uh, my director of sport said, oh, well, you know, everybody can come and row because, you know, there's no con there's no contact. Um, so actually, we've got a real sort of selling point to, to, to people to say, actually, if you're wanting a sport where potentially we'll, we'll be ahead of the game in relation to competitive opportunities or just actually being able to continue the sport when other measures might come in, then that might be a selling point for them. But ultimately, it's down to that, that, that just that understanding of, of where their motivation to go and try another sport is coming from um, and understanding where that's coming from and equally explaining that Yes, things are going to be different, but we can provide opportunities as coaches to, to really um, give new competitive opportunities. And I know that coaches are already talking about a lot more inter-club competition um, because potentially there might only be those, those competitive opportunities, you know, inside the club um, and leagues and all sorts of things. So it depends what their motivation is. If their motivation is that they want to row with their mates and, and they don't get to do that in a single, then have that discussion with them and, and, and um, you know, be really honest about how things will develop and the fact that crew growing will come back. Um, but just establishing that those motivations really and where that's coming from. I think, I mean, it's it's an ongoing thing. It's just not a, it's not always a COVID related um, challenge that that people are going to be drawn to other sports um, and potentially they've done loads of cycling or loads of running whilst they've been off and they want to go off and do that competitively, might maybe um look at how they can integrate that into their training um and yeah well don't come down and row on sundays go and do a part run instead um and 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 looking at how you can can get a bit of a balance between them doing other sports as well um it depends what level of performance they're at it depends what you're wanting from them and their level of commitment as well but there's no reason why they can't do other sports um that's you know strongly encouraged um but obviously depends on how that all works and how you can integrate them back into your program as well but just really having that just open conversation with them to start off with about where that's coming from and, and why why they're being attracted to something else and and if that thing other thing is attractive then can they do both um and there's potentially no reason why not so that'd be my thoughts on that so sarah can i just pick up on that a little bit as well um i i think that there's a there's a huge opportunity for our sport uh, at the moment because um, sing single sculling is what we can do um, so there's a real opportunity to to to, to perhaps find that that future uh, superstar single sculler uh, in, in the coming weeks and months who who might develop over time uh, to be that so perhaps be, we've, we can find an Olympic single sculling champion in, in there but also I think there's an opportunity for us to to collaborate with other sports that are struggling at the moment. Um, you know, rugby is obviously going to be a difficult one. Um, swimming is can't go back in the pool yet. So is there a chance to collaborate with your local 
uh, cl club or with or uh, the other s sports um, within your school um, at, at junior level or at university level. Um, collaborate with other clubs and, and provide um, provide an opportunity to to other people to bring other people to our sport. They they may not be there all the time when when we do come out of COVID, um, but you might find that we catch some people who who want to be your next club secretary or treasurer or or captain or whatever uh, so I, I think there's a real opportunity for for us to draw people into the sport as well here thank you pete just um one last question we we have a um you know a particularly vulnerable group of people in uh, you know nationwide and that is our masters group does the panel have any particular thoughts on coaching and managing um, our masters rowers post COVID? Um, and as the as the questioner asks, a large but potentially vulnerable group in most clubs. So just interested if anybody on the panel would like to make a few comments about um, our masters rowers. Uh, I'd I'd have a, another addition to that would be actually our masters and and almost retired masters because they've got too old for rowing but well, you're never too old for rowing but the the people who are now coaching um who were in their 80s some of them uh, you know how can we make sure we're looking after them as well but um that would just just be my sort of addition to that question um i don't work and with probably masters. our probably our adaptive rowers as well fall into that category as well perhaps if i if i could just jump in here i think that we before before COVID, we'd have looked at everyone um, through the eyes of their set of circumstances. So if somebody had been off ill, we'd have spoken to them about that level of illness and how they came back. You know, if people had um, any form of restrictions, then we would have talked to people about that. And that's no different now to what it would have been before. So for me, there is something about a conversation with those individuals. Um, you know, I could chuckle here and say that, that I've had numerous conversations with over 70 year old scholars who've got their own boats, who've been completely and utterly you know, disgusted that they've not been able to go out rowing. So I think that there has to be those conversations with people, um, you know, but I think we also need to be very clear about what people have gone through. So Rachel talked about, you know, having assessments of where people were at. And I don't see that being any different with our master's group at all. Um, so for me, it, it comes back to the risk assessment and having that conversation with them personally. Can I add that there might be some opportunities here as well, that if we've got some coaches who are feeling vulnerable and some master's groups who perhaps haven't been having as much coaching as they would like, and people's time frames are different now, um, a lot more people are working from home. Um, and ha have more time during the day or perhaps early morning and maybe those groups could start to take up some time in small groups when there aren't quite so many people around so it, it, it's making the most of, of the boats that you've got because a lot of clubs would only have a few small boats so they're going to have to have more time slots anyway um, and so if people's circumstances are different there might be more opportunities there I would support that. Thank you. I'm just conscious of time and um, I'm going to ask Kate if she would just like to wrap up the webinar. Um, so Kate, uh, if I can hand over to you. Yeah, listen, I'd just like to say firstly, thank you to Pete, Vicky and Rachel. That, that was really quite insightful and got me thinking a number of things um, and obviously like to thank everyone who's come today because you've obviously been brought here for a reason um, and if we haven't answered all of your questions then please feel free just to drop an email through to myself um, I've no issue at all of that or drop it through to Sarah uh, we really want to ensure that we're working with our coaching community um, Rachel mentioned about racing you know there is a group at the moment looking about returning to you know some form of competition that's being that's being worked through by Nick Hubble and his group at the moment um, and that will probably be the sort of next set of definitive or changing guidance that will come through um, 
some key messages I've taken away today, which was about prepare yourself and those around you before going out, um, putting yourself first, ensuring that you're in the best place to provide the best support to your rowers and those around you, plan together to make it happen, really important to be planning together. You know, if you're not being approached by your committees, then perhaps you can be approaching your committees. Um, looking for the silver lining, that was something which Pete just talked about then, let's look for the silver lining and opportunities that um, this is presenting ourselves and also as Vicky's just said. And the key thing here for me is about making no assumptions. Just don't make any assumptions at all as we go forward. But again, listen, I'd like to thank you all for, as I say, your time, for coming forward. Um, and look, let's just go out there and, and see where we get to. This is new times for all of us. Um, and so we're going to try some things which are going to work brilliantly and, we'll, and other things that might just not work. So as Pete was saying, just review it. Just re keep have ongoing review. But thank you very much. Well, just want to say thank you to everybody who has attended this evening. Um, the video and the slides will be available on the lockdown webinar page um, in, the, in the next um, day or so. Uh, you'll also find details of other British Rowing webinars on the um, British Rowing website, www.britishrowing.org. You'll also sort, shortly receive a um, feedback request for the webinar. Your feedback is really important to us and it does help us shape future webinars. You can join us on Tuesday the 7th of July for Clean Sport webinar with GB assistant coach for juniors Dan Cooper. And so really just remains for me to say a big thank you to Kate, Pete, Vicky and Rachel for presenting tonight's webinar and to British Rowing's official analytics partner SAS for their support with this lockdown webinar series. So thank you all and have a really good evening and enjoy the rest of the uh, not to be Henley. So take care all.